around you, every day, are young people with mental health problems. And to look at them, you'd never know it. You cry practically every day, and the days that you don't cry, you don't feel anything. I just wanted to end it all the time. That's all I thought about. One in ten young people have a mental health problem and are living with the stigma that comes with the territory. My life just went completely downhill. I stopped talking to friends, family, really I was basically completely isolated. When I feel depressed, killing myself don't even come into it because who just, just can't be bothered. Ever wondered what it's like to have a mental illness like schizophrenia or manic depression? To hear voices or make yourself sick 15 times a day? The people who know are going to reveal what really goes on inside their heads. Everything from A to Z. I don't think I'm exactly different. I just think I choose to live my life a different way. Some people will have nine to five jobs and can cope with that. I have a 24-7 eating disorder and that takes over everything. I am big, fat, ugly, never feel clean. I just really hate myself. Becky is 23 and has been living with anorexia for 11 years. Anorexia is a form of control. Each time you see the scales go down or your clothes are looser, there's just like such a feeling of power. You feel happier temporarily. But, you know, you've got to go for the next one, the next girl. And the scales have to keep going down and down and down. There was problems at home and things, but I was hurting inside. I just wanted something that was my own secret, and I discovered vomiting to begin with. Eating after meals and then making myself sick. And nobody knowing about it. It felt like I was powerful and getting the better of everybody else that hurt me. I didn't know it had a name, didn't know it was an illness. It just felt right. Being 14, I didn't think it was that serious. I thought I could stop it whenever I wanted, but I haven't been able to stop it. Every meal time, it's like you don't deserve this meal. You have to sit there fighting so hard just to put the fork onto the plate, just to start to eat it. And then once it's inside, you just... I personally just feel so dirty and like I'm failing. The best time for me is waking up in the morning and knowing that my stomach's empty. Just eat, you know? what? What's your problem? Just eat it. You do get that a lot. People just turn around and say, well, why don't you just eat it? It's only food. Becky is obsessed with food and eating. Craig's obsessions are different. He has obsessive compulsive disorder. No one really knows what causes OCD, but people who have it will check things again and again or clean compulsively. They hate feeling out of control. Craig's OCD started when he was six. I just started one night where I just drew my curtains, turned around, went to walk up in the bedroom, and I got that little thought, that little nagging thought, thinking, well, actually, is my, you know, what happens if, you know, my curtains aren't drawn? Maybe something bad's going to happen. So I went back and did it, and that's when it started. about three or four hours I spent uh, that one night just holding them I can actually remember it, it's not very nice. Every single object in my bedroom had to be perfect, so it was, you know, I'd have to hold every single object, but I had to do it about, you know, three times, but then one, two, three wasn't enough, so it had to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, if you know what I mean. 
and then but that means it's just two lots, so then it'd have to be three again. So that was three, six, nine, like that. Uh, and that's where all the time this way it's so time consuming, really. If you start feeling really low, and I was only about six, I didn't know what you know what I was feeling really. Uh, I felt sad, really angry sometimes. I used, to, I used to get quite aggressive because you know I was really frustrated. You don't even know why you're doing it. That's just, that's the hard thing about it. You know, you just you just you just have to do it basically. There's no going back. You just can't afford not to do it. It's like a life or death situation, sort of feels like. As Cray grew up, the obsessions grew with him. Things got so bad that when he was 14, he stopped talking. I stopped talking because I was just convinced that I was going to say the wrong thing to everyone. I was just going to upset everyone. I'd be a really, really bad person. And that was my biggest fear, doing things wrong. So I used to go, I don't know, three weeks sometimes, and I'd say about five words in those three weeks. And, you know, everyone was getting really worried by this stage because I wasn't socialising. I actually stopped going to school because I just couldn't handle it. I wouldn't say yes on the register or anything like that. That's how bad it got. We've just been to Tesco to get lots and lots of shower gel and lots of cleaning products and a bit of fruit. Now we're going into the flat for a shower. Like Craig, Ali has OCD. Over the last five years, showering and cleaning compulsively has become a way of life. Is this clean? Is this dirty? Do I need to wash this? Can I use this? Can I wear this? Can I touch that? All the time I'm thinking, when can I have my next shower if I'm going to have one? You have to plan everything around it. So if you're going to do the cleaning, and then you have to have a shower, then you have to have like put clean clothes on, and then you put your washing in the machine, you've got to have another shower, because the washing's dirty as well. So all the time you're thinking, when can I have my new shower? And everything that you wouldn't put in the washing machine goes in the washing machine. Everything. Apparently one scoop's enough, but it's got to be two and a half, because one scoop's not enough, you won't clean it. I'm the one that makes everything dirty. If I'm not clean, it will hurt someone else, and they'll die. Anyone, even if they had, like, some illness, they can't even contaminate my stuff, because it's just mine, and only I can contaminate it. I've got a big, big, big obsession with HIV. Basically, I think I carry it 24-7 around with me and people touch me and catch it off me. Even though I'm now, like, 22 and I do know, like, how HIV spreads, it's just, like, makes you feel really stupid sometimes. Do you make boyfriends quite difficult? Very difficult. Because they're just 20... They're like, what are you doing? And you're like, no, 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 I've got to go and have a shower now. And I won't stay around, like, blokes' houses. I'll stay around girls' houses because I'm not that worried about them. But blokes, it's just like... Even hugs now, I've become really obsessed with, like, no, girls is fine, but men, no, I don't want any hugs because it's all contaminated and it's all about, like, just contact and stuff with the men. It's not logical at all, but it's not logical in your brain. Like, there's so much illogical stuff with OCD. And you just think, what is coming into me? I'm really weird, I'm stupid. And basically, the word freak just comes to mind. You're like, I'm a freak, I'm a freak. OCD can get out of control. Last year, when he was 16, Craig started to believe he was swearing out loud at the people around him, when in fact, he hadn't said anything at all. A lot of the time, I got pains on the temples, all down, just really sharp pains shoot down the back of my neck, because obviously I was t so tense and stressed all the time because it had changed so drastically from, you know, actually physical to all in the mind all the time, you know, these really loud thoughts. But, you know, it's, sometimes it's as loud as I'm actually talking to you now. It was, you know, that loud in my head. And I used to be in silent study in college, and I could actually hear these thoughts in my head, and I'd be convinced that I'd actually, you know, really swore at everyone in the room uh, for no r real reason. I thought, uh oh, you know, I've just said it. And then I used to pinch myself, pinch my stomach, or pinch my leg when I had my hands in my pocket. I used to... I used to just punch myself in the head as hard as I could, about 50 times, 60 times a day. Uh, and I used to bring everyone to tears, you know, all my family, just seeing, just seeing me, you know, I was 17 years old, 16, 17, and I was just there, you know, in the front room, just punching myself as hard as I could. You can imagine what it's like. 
And I thought, if this goes on for you know a year longer, I'm gonna end up killing myself. Thousands of young people end up in hospital every year because of the harm they do to themselves. Becky's eating disorder has landed her in hospital more than once. But it's the long-term health effects that are starting to really worry her. The major things are osteoporosis, infertility, and then you've got your organs, you can damage your organs, heart attack, stroke, you lose your teeth, lose your sight, your hair falls out. Just, you just like become an old person. After 10 years battling with anorexia, Becky's decided to get some help and is living with a group of young women in an eating disorders unit. Everybody's got their own problems and it's recognising when they need space and when they need support. And after a while, you get to recognise that. Try to live as happily as we can together. Just tell you head back for me. I mean, in a female orientated environment, it's quite hard, especially when your own mind is saying you're a lot fatter than that person sat next to you. She's got, she's got a good touch, firm, but gentle. I've got loads of internet friends. They're great support. That's the four of us, um, four members from my work group, and we all met up together in New York. It was so wonderful meeting them all in person. They've got me through a lot of bad times. I was around people who loved me for who I was, and there was no pretense. Just a pink Becky in New York would just do a thing. Becky's just one of over a million people in Britain living with an eating disorder, like anorexia or bulimia. I'm a normal person to anyone who meets me. Um, some people will call me bubbly. Um, people who are really close to me know that I'm a monster because of, you know, bulimia. Holly was still at school when she started binge eating and vomiting. Six years on, she is still bulimic. I'll just eat more than anyone could possibly imagine. Chocolates, donuts, sandwiches, pizza, ice cream, and just shove it all into my mouth without thinking. And, and it's kind of like this weird love-hate relationship with that part, because it's kind of like great and exciting and I'm just shoving all this food in. Um, but then, I, yeah, I always know that I'm going to be sick afterwards because I've done that for like six years, just like being sick like 15 times a day. And that's the horrible part. Really painful on the hands because your teeth like scratch your hand and like bulimics will have scars on their hands from their teeth. And then obviously they've got really swollen throats and my throat is just constantly painful all the time. It started on an Easter Sunday. I was alone in the house. I ate an entire Easter egg to myself and I thought, oh dear, I shouldn't have done that because I don't want to put on any weight. So I went upstairs and I made myself sick in the bathroom. Um, and then it just went on a downward spiral after that. The superficial thing is that it's all to do with, with my weight, but it's actually, I think, psychological more. When something bad happens, even if it's just a friend didn't phone, I'll definitely take that out through binging and vomiting. I hated going through puberty, really hated growing up. And then um, my parents divorced when I was 14 and I couldn't cope. I wasn't old enough to cope. Things often were swept under the mat in my household. So I swept my problems under the mat as well until they, then I repressed them down until until they erupted in the form of an eating disorder. Do you feel angry about it sometimes, though? 
I do sometimes, yeah, with like my dad and sometimes and for not being there for me. But they have to live their lives, it's not their fault. But it's not their fault that I'm messed up, but I do feel really messed up and everyone else is okay. I don't know when I'll stop. It, I've still got areas of my life that I can't cope with. So I won't believe me still, because I still can't cope with like who I am and stuff, I guess. Since he turned 17 a few months ago, Craig's been going to a private clinic for help with his OCD. Craig had various issues. He was very obsessive. So what we did was we worked at Craig not being too worried about what other people thought of him. And he had worries about um, offending other people or perhaps hurting them. And we worked really hard at him, at that not being an issue for him anymore. I have about three, two to three weeks and then I'll have a little spell where you know, they come back. It's all about self-acceptance. So we got him to do something that might make him look ridiculous because if he didn't care, if he doesn't care anymore what people think about him, he'll accept himself more readily. And we do those things quite often and they really do have huge benefits. People don't want to do them. In fact, they really complain. But once they've done them, it's really liberating. I actually walked a banana through, through Knightsbridge on a piece of string and just walked it as if it was a dog and that was really tough. People just looked at me, I had security guards come up to me and just say things. You know, every single eye, pair of eyes was just fixed on me. And I had people kick it, step on it and run away before I start laughing and things like that. But I also had people shout out, beat their horns, call me names and things and that was a bit harder. Because, you know, it's just so much tension. The next stage of Craig's therapy was making a fool of himself on the underground. Westminster, Mansion House, Liverpool Street. I'd come to you know, Oxford Street and shout Oxford Street, and then I'd have people just look at me like that and then look away. Temple. I thought I was just crazy, probably. Cannon Street. You know, it sounds crazy to actually, you know, to actually go and do it. Blackfriars. But the second you do it, you just feel completely free, you feel you know, the whole world just lift completely off of you. Now I'm just completely you know, so at ease with myself really. I have a thought and I think, okay, you know, I can just, I know it's an OCD thought, which is so nice, it's like heaven, because I'm not actually scared of my thoughts anymore. Heidi started smoking cannabis when she was 16. At the time, she didn't believe that smoking too much could make her depressed, suicidal and paranoid. She hadn't heard of cannabis psychosis. My mate warns me, she was a couple of years older than me, and she goes, Heidi, look at me now, I've lost the plot, that's cannabis. And I go, no, I'm fine, I won't, and I did. Before i had done all that puff, like, I was normal. And it's just like, I think through the effects of that, that's what's made me like this now. Puff and ease and speed and stuff. 100% I know that's why, that's what messes you up. I wasn't taking it occasionally, it was like too excessive amount. I, I was just taking so much. I went mad at it, doing more and more and more. Now I just get major, 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 major paranoid now things that go buzzing around my head and it's just like I can't make it stop in it so that's why I like smoking ganja that that like slows down my thinking but then it makes my paranoia worse I like I think about everything I think I think what other people think I think of all the things that they could be thinking and and it just drives me crazy sometimes if I'm walking down the road and a car bibs at me I think all right couple of cars bib, 
and I think it was like un undercover CID and they're following me or something like that. And it just feels like you're being watched or people are talking about you. Your heart feels like it's flying out of your chest. It's like you come over all hot and it's just like, got to get out of here, got to get out of here. Oh my God, it's hard to explain, you know, but that's, that's, that's how I feel. Heidi thinks that smoking too much weed has made her paranoid. But paranoia can also be caused by mental illnesses, like schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is when you can't quite tell what's real and what's not real that's going on in your head. Seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling something that's not there, and you completely and utterly believe it's there. A really good way of describing it I heard once was looking at the world through a shattered windscreen so you can still make out things, concepts, ideas, people but they seem slightly distorted. Like a lot of people who have got schizophrenia, Emma started showing signs of the illness when she was 18 and left home to go to university. It was very ironic I was doing psychology and I guess it kind of didn't help at the time because I was going to lectures and I was feeling very sensitive and paranoid about my personality and then there were kind of big blown up images of brains on the wall and they were tracing neural pathways through them. I remember me telling my mum at one point that I wanted to sue the university for sending me mad because I really felt that's what they were trying to do. I would see things like geometric shapes appearing and twisting around. I saw, um, at one point I saw a kind of helter skelter and there were all these cartoon characters on little cars coming, rolling around and down it. Um, one particularly pleasant um, image was Damon Albarn from Blur coming in my bedroom and doing a bit of a twirl and walking out again. That was incredibly cool. So some of it was actually quite enjoyable for a, for a short time. I really thought that I could control things um, just by moving my pen holder or kind of putting a makeup brush the other way up. It would make something happen in the world. And it just suddenly occurred to me that the most natural explanation for this was that I was in fact God. I could make things happen. I was the business. I could do whatever I wanted, whenever I wanted. And that included things that were impossible. I did start going to church. And there'd be all these people praying and talking to God and talking about the Bible. And there's me sitting there thinking, well, I know it all and I'm here. David's got schizophrenia too. He started hearing a group of voices in his head after his mum died. I hear voices. I'll be sitting down at home and I think I'm hearing the next door neighbour speaking or something, as if I can hear her speaking through the walls and that. And I'll get up and I'll walk around and I realise it's actually the voice that's just messing around. When I hear these voices, they'll sound as real as you sound to me now. I wouldn't say they pick on me. They're just very, they just seek to be very humiliating, very depressing. Um, try and push me towards wanting things that will cause me to deteriorate as a person. In my head is, I'd say, busy, quite potentially threatening and dangerous. In that I am the odd one out. Everybody else there is complete fantasy, and whereas I'm, I'm real, that can interact with the fantasy. But because, of, because of that, I am the odd one out. And because of that, that's, if they were picking on me, then that would be their reason to be picking on me. And that they can't, they can't interact with the real world at all. It can be disorientating at times. David had been hearing the voices for seven years before a mental health worker diagnosed him with schizophrenia. I said, well, 
I've got schizophrenia. That, that doesn't make sense. I always thought schizophrenia was something else. And he says, no, 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 it's audible delusions. That's what schizophrenia is. I was like, okay, thank you. <laughs> I finally know what is actually wrong with me and what it's called. From studying psychology, Emma knew that hallucinations, delusions and paranoia might mean she had schizophrenia. But she was just too paranoid to get help. I was completely in a, in a different planet. I'd surrendered completely to all the delusions and the hallucinations and things. I suddenly had this really strong impulse to kill myself because I thought my whole life was over. I wasn't ever going to have a future. I'd let my family down. I'd let myself down. I had no friends. So it just seemed easier to take an overdose and, and not live anymore. I took them and just washed them down with fruit, fruits of the forest um, squash, which I can't drink to this day. Um, and um, I kind of just laid there, lay there and waited to die. Um, I kept falling asleep and I'd wake up and think, I'm still alive. I'd just wake up and think, I'm still alive, I don't want to be alive. And it just went on for four days and, I, and then eventually I thought, well, I'm not dying. Um, I've kind of, I can't even do that and I said to my housemate, can you get a doctor? So she called the doctor round who took one look at me and said, when did you turn yellow? And I hadn't even realised I had. Emma was rushed to hospital with acute liver failure and her parents were told she wouldn't survive the night. I was in hospital and I kind of woke up and my parents were standing at the end of my bed and looking completely devastated and almost petrified like statues there. I feel terrible for what I put my parents through. I mean, they, they, they really genuinely thought that that was the last time they were going to see me. So it's very lucky that I pulled through. Lindsay tried to kill herself as well and ended up in hospital during her first year at university. I had a headache, I started taking painkillers and I just kept swallowing them. And I really didn't care. I was just kind of, well, we'll see what happens. Um, yeah. I got taken to hospital and told everyone that it was an accident. A week later, Lindsay admitted to a psychiatrist that she'd really meant to kill herself. I actually saw a really nice doctor who basically said, look, you are going to be in hospital. I need to have you in hospital because I'm worried that you're going to hurt yourself. Um, so if you come in voluntarily, then we get you better and you leave. If you won't come in, then I'm going to have to section you, and that means you're here for 28 days minimum. Um, so that little part of my brain, which was still capable of thinking, <laughs> said, OK, yes, I'll stay. I'm so glad that I did. I was diagnosed when I was in hospital um, with manic depression and I started taking medication properly. That actually helped, that did something. With manic depression you have extreme mood swings, unbelievable highs followed by depressing lows and then back up again. I feel very elated, but very, very happy. I have a million thoughts all the time. I'll lie in bed at night and I won't be able to sleep because I've just, I haven't got thoughts and ideas and things are just going and I have to get up out of bed and do things. A lot of people, me included, um, start taking quite big risks. And you do things like taking drugs, sleeping around, spending lots of money, because you just feel like nothing can hurt you. You're driving too fast and running across the roads and, you know, go out in the middle of the night and start talking to strangers. It's, um, I've never been arrested, but I know people who have. It's like being just high all the time and never having to come down. Of course, you do have to come down, but that comes later. It's like a great big crash and then a pretty major depression kind of sets in afterwards, which is really scary. Insomnia, panic attacks, 
I would self harm. Um, I hated myself. I just, I didn't want to go on living. It was, it was like being in a black hole. You, you can't get out of it. And you can't think clearly. You can't put thoughts together. Um, it's kind of like wading through treacle. Everything slows down. It would take me two hours to get dressed in the morning. You can't make a decision. You can't decide, I'm going to wear that pair of socks. You sit staring at the socks in the drawer for half an hour. And you can't understand what's going on around you because it, it's going so fast. And oh. <laughs> I wouldn't want to go back there. Manic depression only affects one person in a hundred. If you're feeling seriously down, it's much more likely you've got depression. It's the most common mental health problem in the world. On a bad day, it's like a black cloud and it's very difficult to see through and it's like talking to people with a wall between you and them. When she was 16, OJ left home. She found living on her own really difficult, and that's when her problems with depression began. I was very, very, very depressed, and I'd run out of ideas. I'd got to the point where I felt like I couldn't cope anymore. I had nobody, so I kind of thought, well, you know what? If not, nobody's going to miss me, and I, nothing can be worse than this. And so I tried to kill myself then. Life was too hard, and I just couldn't be bothered with it anymore. After her suicide attempt, OJ was admitted to hospital. She ended up staying there for nearly a year. As the months passed, she lost her flat, her job, and put on loads of weight. Her depression just got worse. At 17, I was placed on an adult acute psychiatric ward, and for me, that was very scary. It was quite terrifying. I had electroconvulsive therapy, ECT, and I had about 12 sessions of that. I think there's some sort of belief that what happens is the electric convulsive therapy changes the wet brain wave patterns, and that will lift your depression. So it works on the basis that um, depression is somehow medical and sort of physical, and that that will help lift it. You're not conscious. But for me, I found it very difficult. I was very tearful after each session. I had some problems with short-term memory loss afterwards. I'm terrified of needles, so I found sort of having the anaesthetic very traumatic. I'd wake up very, very tearful. And then there's also the fact that it didn't work, and that was really difficult for me. I was desperate for an answer. Sometimes treatment for severe mental health problems can have negative side effects, as Lindsay found out when she was diagnosed with manic depression. I was prescribed lithium when I was diagnosed when I was in hospital. It's a mood stabiliser, and it's a very effective mood stabiliser, but it's also a poison. I was ill constantly. I had diarrhoea and was constantly nauseous. You shake all the time. You can't concentrate, you start losing words and your language becomes distorted. It helped, um, but the side effects were so awful that I just, I couldn't get out of bed in the morning basically because I felt too ill, so, you know, I wasn't able to live a decent life, um, so I stopped taking it. And then, of course, you go through the whole manic depression thing again. Um, and finally, I went to see a doctor who said, oh, there are some other drugs you could try. Lindsay still has manic depression, but she's taking medication that works for her and hasn't had an episode for 18 months. I used to be desperate to fall asleep and I never wanted to wake up. And now, when I go to bed at night, I can't wait for the next morning. And that is, ugh, I can't describe how good that feels.
couple of years ago, Cheryl went through a bad time with bullying at school and got very depressed. She started self-harming after reading about it in a magazine. Just grabbing razors, trying to slice them into my arms, legs, whatever I could, like reading books and everything, like your main arteries are in your legs, I thought, yeah, I'll try there, and just whatever. And when I think about it, I think, oh, how could, how could someone do that, or how could I have done that? But when you're so angry and upset, when you do it, it does feel like it's releasing the pain for you, and it feels like everything's going away and you feel better, but after, you just feel disgusted with yourself for going free with it. It's horrible because you think, how could it have got this bad for me to want to kill myself, want to do this to my skin? You know, why has it got this bad? And I, I mean, I used to take it out my mum as well. I used to shout her and scream at her and blame her, but there was nothing she could have really done. I think she knew something was up. I was always wearing jumpers and it was summer and everything, so someone must have known something was going on. But I didn't really have that closeness with my mum when it was happening. Cheryl asked a girl she knew for help, who told her about sniffing cans. And she was like, yeah, you, you, you know what you're going through, just try it, it might help you. And I started, and in the end I could go for a can of just sniffing that easily, without any trouble, and just lay there and just feel no pain, and it felt a load better. But... When she left, because she moved away, when she moved away, it was sort of like, well, maybe I shouldn't be doing that now. And I was seeing all these cans, and I was thinking, how am I going to get rid of them with a decent explanation? Cheryl was lucky. 60 people a year die from sniffing cans, and most of them are still at school. School can be tough. Bullying, exam stress, the pressure to look good and fit in. It can all get you down. We have to fit in, otherwise you just get trampled on. But I didn't realise that until it was a bit late. When Jenny went to secondary school, she started getting bullied. I guess I was an easy target, because I've always been a bit quieter than everyone else and different and more interested in, like, staying at home than going out and things like that. And they just said I was weird. And I just let them say I was weird and I believed it. Nobody talked to me. People avoided me because they knew I was the loser girl. Your friends, you're supposed to be your friends. And they just turned on me. They joined the, the clan of bullies and beat me up as well. I felt like the most alone person in the whole world. Like, it was just so I just didn't go to lessons. I just shouted at teachers and threw stuff in classes and smashed things. and was like the angriest person you could ever meet. As the months went on, the bullying got worse and Jenny's mum and dad could see her getting more and more depressed. So they moved her to a new school. She'd left the bullies behind, but the bad memories came back every night as nightmares. Like, really horrific nightmares. Dead people, bodies, murders. I wrote them down for a while. But, like, exploding mines, people getting slammed into walls and things, and just pretty horrible. Some were memories of nightmares, but most of them were just really horrible, random things. That, that went on for a while. I was on sleeping pills for a while, because I wouldn't go to sleep, because I was just so scared. Jenny had post-traumatic stress disorder. She couldn't sleep, had panic attacks, and worst of all, started hearing screaming voices in her head. It was like a, a woman, or like a, a girl, just screaming all the time. Like a migraine, but with screaming. And it was, it was the scariest thing ever. And I'm so glad I'm not there now. It went on until like a year ago, a bit less, when I finally just, it died off and just stopped. But it was horrible, because it supports the, you think you're mad, and then that just confirms it for you, and you're just like, fine, I'm, I'm crazy. Everything, there's nothing to live for now, it's just awful. That was me, my inner scream, trying to, trying to get out, if you like. I don't want to overanalyze it, it's just no, it was stress. But I think that's basically what it was. All the two and a half years worth of fear coming out in one really big migraine. 
I've been doing a lot of writing about my experiences because it sort of gets it out and you can just let go and feel things rather than having to squash your emotions all the time, which is never good because they come out eventually anyway. Angry tears welled in her eyes, spilling over onto her cheeks as she realised just how unfair life was sometimes. She longed for the innocence she once had, the belief that good always triumphed over evil, and that it really was a happily ever after. If only someone knew what was really going on inside her head, inside her head, inside her head. I didn't talk to anyone for a long time and then I met like a close group of people that I could actually talk to and it's like you can let everything out and just open up. You're not scared anymore and you begin to get your confidence back. What makes a good friend? Someone who listens, who cares, someone you can trust. Cheryl's school has a counsellor, Carrie, who's there to help students with any problems, but mostly just to talk. I think it is really hard being a teenager and I think one of the reasons it's so hard is because it's assumed that it's easy and teachers and adults think that it's the greatest time of your life when it isn't. It's when all the things that are going to happen in your life happen really, isn't it? Relationships, friends, boys, girls. I still haven't got my confidence back. I can't walk anywhere on my own. I'm too scared to and it may sound stupid but I can't. It sounds stupid to some people but... If people actually realised the pain that we went through, like mentally, then I don't think they'd, they'd say that's stupid. I'm quite good Carly has been seeing Carrie for over a year now. She was getting panic attacks at school nearly every day. Well, I fell out with my friends, and then they kind of they turned everyone against me, and it was like, well, my whole class. I walked into my classroom, and everyone was staring at me and whispering as I walked past. Just got really down. Didn't want to be around people. I started having panic attacks when I come into school. Just couldn't breathe. It was like I've got to get out of here and I'll run and I'll run. School made Kylie so anxious that she got depressed and lost her self-confidence. In the end, she couldn't face the thought of going in at all. So she stayed at home for nearly a year. I felt like nobody actually understood me. You know, I think the only person who did was my mum and she tried everything to help me get back to school. I missed out on so much. Not just at school, but in my life. I missed a year of my life. It's just horrible. I didn't have any friends. I couldn't go out. Um, I was bored. Um, over the year, I put on loads of weight. I hated every day of it. It made me feel really bad about myself. So you'll grow out of it? I don't think I'll ever grow out of it. Because I don't think I'm just going to wake up one day and think, oh, you're gorgeous, you're brilliant. Because everyone said bad things about me. That's in there now. Puff. Queer. Batty boy. Today, um, someone shouted, oh, there's the queer boy. School has been a nightmare for John. While he's been struggling with his sexuality, he's been getting a hard time from the bullies because he's gay. Like Cheryl and Kylie, he's been talking to the school counsellor. I started getting attracted to boys. At first I thought it was just a phase where I was just going to, oh, it's just going to pass and not come back, but it just didn't go. So I just started to think, oh, I must be gay then. At first I thought it was disgusting because my mind was a bit messed up, so I didn't really understand what was going on. I was worried, stressed, depressed. I just used to sit there thinking there's no point in life. I just used to cry myself asleep, cry for hours. After months of depression, John decided to tackle the problem head on. And with help from teachers and friends, he came out. And I thought, well, if I'm like this, then I'm like this. I can't really do much to change it. I just thought, what's the point in hiding away forever?
I was in one of my lessons and my drama teacher, he said, do you want to come out in this lesson? And he's just started like addressing my class and saying, most of you know about John. And then I stood up and I just said, I'm gay. And it's a rather quick reaction. What was their reaction? <laughs> um, some people were just like, that's disgusting. And started like saying names, stuff like that. But most people in my drama class were very supportive of me. What makes you happy? My friends. Um, I love my friends to bits and they love me as well. That one of you there is. That, that was just a <laughs> Jenny's putting her problems with bullying behind her. She loves her new school and even has that a best friend, Lizzie. Is that one, isn't it? Uh, I think so. I was that before or after this? I didn't realise that people could like me really for who I am. <laughs> and then I suddenly, someone yeah. did. And it was the, the nicest thing ever. I just realised, I don't know how I ever managed without friends. Because you really need them. <laughs> I had to kind of learn again how to be friends with people and how to like interact with people because I've been inside myself on my own for so long I want to stay that way but like meeting Lizzie was like coming out of my shell it was like oh. I mean, it's been hard and there have been moments where I just thought oh, this is just I'm doing everything wrong I'm the worst friend in the world but then you get the really good times where you just laugh about stupid things and just have fun which I've forgotten what that was like You can't tell just by looking at someone what's going on inside their head. But you can be certain that one person in every four has a mental health problem of some kind. I'm really proud of myself. I'm really proud of what I've been through. I've had an illness. It doesn't change who I am. People do come through this. You see it all the time in magazines and TV programmes where they're doing so well. And Gives you someone to look up to. Someone to say, yeah, she's done it, maybe I can. I just feel much more content than myself. I honestly feel that I'm as good as anyone else now. You know, no one's better or worse than me. Apart from the paranoia and depression and anxiety and the panic attacks and that, minus that, I like, I like my personality now. I think it's cool. <laughs> <laughs>